Today, I'm going to talk about the materials inside week 14, and I'll devote most of the class to uh, the new and, and the last uh, set of readings from a young adult, adult novel from 1911 entitled Motor Maids Across the Continent. Before I do that, however, I want to review once again with you the calendar. I want to show you the shortlist for the final exam. I've shortlisted the topics for the final exam to give you a sense of the priorities for your preparation. And uh, as promised, I will answer any questions coming from you about the final project or the presentation before I proceed with my lecture. Okay, so this is the page for week 14. Week 13 is also <laughs> devoted to the same uh, topic, although last week we did something else. We finished watching the Le Mans film with Steve McQueen and talked about the contents and the themes of that film. So we're making up this week, we're doing what you found under 13 and uh, 14, because there is one presentation that you find on both weeks and another one that is listed, but it's simply a copy of the a selection of the pages, especially from the beginning, with some marks that I will use in class to talk about the book. Week 14 is also where you find the short list for the final exam that we'll review in a short while. And you find there listed this week's film, which will be the last film, a beautiful film entitled The Crowd Roars, about car racing in the early 1930s. And there is a page with an extensive synopsis, including uh, analytical remarks for that. As usual, the assignments are just to continue with the readings and then work on your presentation and your final exam. A look at the calendar today and Thursday of these weeks will be the last two meetings that will happen in this classroom because next week instead of meeting here for lecture I'll be meeting individually with the students on Zoom. So from the calendar, you can see the dates that are available for the presentations. And even though you have a detailed presentation of, of what happens on each of these days, the moment you click on any of the links called Calendly, you will see all of the options, so you don't really have to scroll to find a day. The moment I click in here, you see all of the dates from the 4th to the 14th included where you can schedule your presentation. And if you choose one, let's say the 12th, then next on the sidebar, you will find all the times that you can select to schedule your presentation. And as those times are taken, they automatically disappear from the list of options. So if I'm interested in this side, I brought my reading glasses by mistake instead of the regular glasses. So there are no times available after 12 p.m. in this case, but 120 is available. If I want to select that, all I have to do is fill up the simple form, provide first name, last name, your email. You don't really have to add anything at this point. And if you want to have a text reminder, you can add your phone, but that's fine. That's not a required field. When you press schedule event, then you receive an email. Of course, for the email box, 
be professional, use your Stony Brook uh, Gmail address, and there, to your inbox, within a minute, you will receive a message with the details of your scheduled meeting, the time, the day. Keep that, archive that message, because from that message, you can quickly cancel and reschedule, okay? If you cannot do that, if you lose your, uh, that, that email, you can simply go back to the calendar, go back to Calendly, schedule a time, a different a meeting at a different time. But if you cannot cancel your previous meeting, then please email me saying, Professor, I've rescheduled. Can you please cancel the meeting I had on December 7th? Etc. My question was about the okay. canceling. So the first one okay. I put in, I, something came up. Sure, no problem. Okay, it's quick and easy. And as I suggested, schedule your meeting as soon as possible so that you have a time slot that works for you. And if you have to reschedule, you can do that later. This is for a presentation that. Uh, will be conducted live on Zoom. With your message, you will receive the link to connect to the Zoom room. I will grant you sharing privileges so that during your presentation, when you're ready to start, you should take control of the screen, put on the screen, preferably, the passage or passages that you want to talk about, show the story or stories that you want to talk about, and just discuss their contents, moving from one passage to another. Make sure you have enough to say for about 10 minutes. You can have, as I said earlier in other meetings in this classroom, if you want to have some notes that you review, that's fine, but it's supposed to be a presentation, not a reading of your project. I'll be reading your project when you submit it. During this time for this particular assignment, I want to see that you are able to talk, even imperfectly. You don't have to be formally perfect, but that you're able to discuss these themes, that you are able to go from your presentation of a theme to a relevant example, that you're able to read an example and analyze it and find themes that are relevant to the technologies of mobility in there. It could be one of the three short stories that you will include in the project, because just one might provide enough material for 10 minutes. Don't make this a very quick, quick and rushed catalog of every single story that you have in your project. Go for the best examples, go for the most interesting passages. You don't have to, even if you have one story, it, your presentation might not be a comprehensive presentation of the story. And although for the project you have a template that you're following, the presentation is different. For the presentation, you might improvise in a different way, go from the passage in the story that motivated you to pick that particular story, or the profile of the characters, or present a short summary of the story. But again, keep in mind that the submitted written project and the oral presentation don't have too much, right? It wouldn't make sense for me to have you do the same job twice. It's the same material, but in one case, the presentation, you just talk about the stories, the materials in the story. And presumably, many of you will not have a completed project at the time of your presentation, but just something that is a work in progress. And in fact, if, this, if that is the case for you, you can even benefit from the feedback that I will provide at the end of your
representation, telling you what I think of the story, what I think of your selection of passages, of your analysis, of the focus that you have placed on themes that are compatible with the focus of the class, which would allow you to revise your angle, adjust, if needed, before the submission of the project. And once again, if you go through the various pages of the calendar under final project and final exam, you also find the deadline for the completion of the final project, which is December 14th. Uh, the, the last day for the presentations before the end of the day. As I said, giving a, your presentation on Zoom is the best way to do this and it works to your advantage because let's say you're just reading your presentation, I will ask you to stop reading and just talk about the stories, right? and you can still get a decent grade or a good grade for your presentation. If you opt for the alternative, which would be to record a video of your presentation, preferably with Zoom, and you send it to me, then whatever you've done, even if you've opted for a style that is not the style of a presentation, whereby you are on zoom in video and you're reading everything and even if you I don't see the page I, I can feel that you're reading then your grade will be lower with no possibility to change that on the fly modify your approach and get a better grade so the 14th is the deadline both for the presentation and for the final project okay uh, if you opt for a pre-recorded video, you should upload that video somewhere in the cloud and then share it with me through a link. You can email me the link or you can place the link inside your Google Docs file, just add the heading, oral presentation, pre-recorded video, and then underneath you can place a link. Make sure that you grant me sharing privileges so that I can download the video and uh, store it on my computer, watch it uh, once or more than once, depending on the case, okay? Usually at the end of your presentation, I will provide a feedback that includes a, an idea or, or exactly a grade, an idea of the grade or, or the, the exact grade, meaning I have to think about it, but this could be B plus or an A minus, or yes, uh, I'm going to give you an A for this presentation. For the pre-recorded videos, I will place the grade inside the Google Docs file, which is the place where eventually you will also find your grade for the final exam and your grade for participation, your grade for the class, etc. For, for the, the, the grade for uh, your uh, assignments, etc. Right? Okay. Let me proceed with the short list for the final exam and then I'll take any questions on anything from the presentation to the project to the exam. So I sat down yesterday and decided what the areas for the creation of the questions will be for the final exam. I haven't written the exam, I have notes right now. So these are the topics that you're supposed to review in preparation for the final exam when the time comes, right? The exam is kind of late. We, we can see the date on the calendar, December 19th, Tuesday. Okay, so as you see, there are two sections because some of the questions will be based on the readings, other will be based on the films. And as you know, there will be five questions. You have to answer four of that, any four of your choices. So review the following topics. There are readings about the inspiration for the class and the core concepts and the definitions, the working definitions for the class. You find that under weeks one and two. 
review the excerpts and the presentations related to Jules Verne's novel The Master of the World from 1904, and then Alice Williamson's The Lightning Conductor, Louise Closer Hale's A Motor Car Divorce, and the one that we'll be talking about this week, Catherine Stokes' The Motor Maids Across the Continent. So, just to provide some guidance, the first point, the core concept and definitions, the most important thing there is the matrix, the set of parameters that define what is a modern technology, a modern individual technology, which places technologies on a spectrum that goes from the automobile to social media or your smartphones, right? That's the most important part. Try to understand that definition, that matrix, the various definitions, and how they would apply to the work that we've done during the semester, to the readings that we have covered. Jules Verne, the master of the world, you have extensive presentations and selections of excerpts uh, about that, I would say, focused especially within the introduction to this novel on the narrative pattern that defines the various stages of the encounter of humans with the technology, from anticipation to seduction to abduction and the possibility of separation from the technology with the condemnation of the technology, right? Use that when you review the readings. Don't just focus on the details that you find on the readings. Let the major ideas come up from your review of those readings. For the last three sets of readings, for the last three novels by Alice, Louise, and Catherine, of course, the major theme is the empowerment of women the gender gap that disappears thanks to the interaction with the new automotive technology, the ways in which the female characters in these three novels change and feel that they have, they are in a position to entertain different social relationships with members of society in general with men in particular, now that they have become fluent with the technology, in the technology, familiar with the technology. So let this kind of theme, of general themes and the various subtopics related to it, guide your review of those readings. Again, don't be taken by all the small developments in the novel, the questions will not be tell me what happens after um, Molly goes to dinner with James. Rather, what is the significance of scenes such as that? But my questions will not be uh, checking on your knowledge of specific episodes. But you'll be fine as long as you have some examples to mention. Madison. Would memorizing perhaps a relevant quotes be recommended or would paraphrasing? No, because the exam, during the day of the exam, you will find on your desk a packet with a selection of suitable examples, which doesn't mean that you can only use those examples, but they provide some material and an opportunity for you to leave quotes and include them in the essay. So let's say the question, one of the questions in the final exam is based on a motor car divorce. You wouldn't find all of the tens of pages that were in the excerpts. It's the same buzzing noise that we say, had last that week. Again? Yeah, let me sh lower the volume in here. We don't need it. So maybe we'll be able to fix it from here. Okay, thank you for alerting me of that. 
So I would say, let's say that the question focuses on a motor car divorce and the character of Peggy in that novel, you would find a few pages of select scenes and episodes that you can use if you want, especially if you want to support your argument with references to the language or references to the, the details of some of the episodes. So the answer would be no, don't try to memorize examples, but try to have some significant examples in mind. So let's say, as I said, if the topic of the question is the empowerment of the woman, what are the examples that show change, right? How the character behaved before and how the character is behaving now. What are the <laughs> examples that you could quote? So let's say the conclusion of the novel or uh, the, the moment uh, that they're stopped by a rope thief and uh, she is taken into a farmhouse and this peasant girl uh, admires all of her clothings and treats her like a queen because as a consumer she has uh, presented, she is presenting herself surrounded by this and being defined by these accessories, right? So we see there the definition of her identity through her um, choice in, in the elegance of her, her clothes, etc., right? So focus on this kind of approach rather than the plethora of small details. Go ahead. Related more to the final project in and of itself. You Can we wait for the final project for, for questions? Let me go through this and then we can deviate with questions. Okay, so I told you what to focus for the last three readings especially. You find six films from which I will uh, uh, pick some for the questions and they are Herbie the Lovebug, Christine and Bumblebee. I place them here uh, based on a, a logic that I will explain in a moment. And another group of film is the first author, The Crowd Wars and Le Mans. So clearly in here you have three movies where the major topic is the change of the main character after they start interacting with their automotive counterpart, right? Herbie for Jim Douglas, Christine for Arnie Cunningham, and B-127 for Charlie in Bumblebee. So when we review the notes for those films, or if you have a chance, you review the films and remember, when you go back to the pages for the films, you always find not only how to find them on Amazon, but I also include it every time, the justwatch.com link that allows you to see if, let's say you have another streaming platform, if they're available there on Netflix, on Paramount Plus, or uh, Sony, etc. okay? Um, some of these movies, for example, The First Auto or The Crowd Wars, might be available on archive.org. Keep in mind that archive.org also has a wide collection, an ample collection of uh, films. But, so the first group, the major topic would be through the interaction with the automobile, how are the characters, the main characters in the film, experiencing a change, what kind of change, what kind of interaction do they have with the car, what kind of symbiotic relationship is established with the technology, etc. The first group that includes the film that will watch a selection of scenes from on Thursday is a series of films with, in two of them, uh, the theme of racing and the life of race car drivers. The first one has some references to racing, but in general talks about the development of the automotive technology and its industry. 
But there is a commonality, there is a common theme, as you will see through the last film. That is to say that the protagonists in here, or their antagonists as well, have a conflicted relationship with the automobile because there is something that keeps them from immersing themselves in that world entirely. This is true of the father in the first auto, but the son as well experiences the issues that stem from his conflict with the father based on the refusal, the rejection of the automobile by the father. Both in Le Mans and The Crowd Roars, we find protagonists who are race car drivers whose personal issues and the relationships they have with their inner circle of, of friends or lovers, there are issues that they have to go through in order to become winners, right? Winners meaning, you know that in Le Mans, Steve McQueen, Michael Delaney doesn't win the race, but he has a personal victory, right? He feels confident at the end that he has given his best, that he was able to immerse himself completely in the experience of driving. And the same is true for the crowd roars, as you will see where the protagonist is Joe, a victorious race car driver who has some deep personal issues, cannot commit to a long-term relationship with uh, his, his partner and companion Lee, has a drinking problem, doesn't really, cannot really express in a convincing way why he is risking his life driving at high speed on a racetrack weekend after weekend and only when he is able to address those personal and interpersonal issues he will be a full individual able to drive fast on the racetrack and and be a full human in life right and the same is true for for Le Mans where Michael Delaney has to uh, fight his inner demons the trauma uh, from the traumatic memories of the accident where Lisa's husband Piero Belgetti died the previous year at Le Mans and also he himself is faced with a choice between his own possibility of a long-term relationship with Lisa or devoting himself just to the career and that is what he will do at least at the time the story is shown in the film because in some ways the film is open-ended right you have at the end Lisa and Michael looking at each other with with an understanding that something could have happened didn't happen but it, it doesn't mean that they will not meet again or that he uh, might not change from that point of view films from the 1960s and 70s often had conclusions that were somewhat open-ended compared to uh, a lot of the movies today with the exception of those that are part of a franchise and therefore you have to leave something for the next uh, iteration of the series for the next Fast and the Furious or the, ne the next Marvel Comics film etc okay so even though you have six films keep in mind when you review the notes or scenes from these films that you have specific themes to focus on and once again this allows you to reduce the number of details or to review with a different eye episodes that would be emblematic of course for the films i cannot provide anything in class but the way that I address this possible shortcoming is to include at least two different films in uh, any question about films so that you have more to pick from uh, 
within your memory in terms of examples and references, right? And put together a meaningful answer. The main suggestion for the final exam is try to be specific. Try not to provide a generic answer. Try to provide specific details, specific references to characters and situation, and try to articulate a topic, right? Because a lot of these topics are not flat, cannot be summarized in just one line, but what is the change that a character undergoes? Or how is an issue articulated through the narrative, the storyline of the film or the novel? Okay, so once again, your opportunity for questions about the final exam, about the presentations, about the project. Madison, would you like to yes. start? <clears throat> you mentioned that we should research into the author to get some background information on them for the project. Along, and we are also allowed to look up any supplementary reading that yes. might be mentioned within. But would you like us to specifically pinpoint articles for citation? with regards to the historical context of the novel, even if it's, or the short story, even if it's not mentioned itself, the story? Only if that comes into play for your analysis, meaning if you want to expand your analysis to references of a historical or sociological nature, then suitable secondary sources could be included and uh, uh, cited uh, within the text or in inside footnotes. I wouldn't see that as a requirement, okay. right? And the same is true for any biographical or professional information about the author. If you find that the author is a well-known figure with entries in a biographical dictionary, in an encyclopedia, uh, etc then whatever information you summarize or quote should be accompanied with appropriate citations of the source. Yes? Um, so just to reiterate, the presentation that we're going to be doing, it's going to be, we're going to be discussing the same themes that are we're elaborating on for the final stream. For the project, yes. So it should be on one or more of the three stories that you are going to include on the project, right? But in the presentation you show, you demonstrate your ability to freely discuss the topics, your ability to read and analyze, right? And keep in mind your angle as a presenter, you're presenting for an average reader, not for the instructor of this class, right? So whatever you say should be comprehensible even if you were talking to your friend who's taking organic, organic chemistry with you but it's not taken this class and doesn't know anything about automobile, right? So you're trying to make an argument that the material you found is extremely relevant and what is that makes it so interesting? What are the elements in the story or the elements in the profiles of the characters or what are the specific uh, uh, passages and the language in those passages that makes it an interesting example, right? So keep that in mind. And the other, at the other end of my previous suggestion, be specific. There would be the recommendation to stay away from obvious comparisons, right? If you have a story where the circumstances of the characters reflect a different kind of society, a different kind of social class, something that uh, is, is confined to the past, to go at length through a comparison with how life has changed now or how automobiles are different now would not be meaningful, right? It goes without saying that the cars, for example, the mechanical aspects of the cars in those stories are different compared to nowadays. So would it be relevant to uh, uh, spend time during the presentation or the project to explain that the car in the story only has three gears and all cars nowadays have five, seven, eight gears? No, it's just different technology. 
the focus of the class was on the culture surrounding the technology of the automobile. There are some technical details that have no relevance in the discussion because the way we think of the automobiles or the way automobiles are represented in books and films is not dependent on the number of years. It's not dependent on the use of diesel fuel uh, versus gasoline or benzene, right? Those elements are part of the history of the engineering of the technology, not about the social history of the technology, right? So stay away from anything that, even though accurate, even though uh, uh, correct, might not be relevant for the kind of explorations that we've conducted in this class. You have a question? Oh, sorry. I saw you moving. I thought you were trying to raise your hand. More questions about these things? Yes, go ahead. You had yeah. to need to be 10 minutes long? At least 10 minutes. You can, it can be more than 10 minutes. Uh, no more than 15 minutes so that we have time, uh, at least five minutes, for me to provide feedback, right? And as I said before, uh, for, for the kind of presentation that I have in mind, given the fact that you don't really need to have a systematic presentation of everything you found about the topic, if at some point you don't have time to continue, you know that there is the project where you'll be able to present more ideas, right? A selection of the work done on your project would be sufficient for me to assess your ability to discuss the themes. So that's the idea. So you will not be penalized if you don't get to the conclusion of your presentation, right? Uh, unless you you need more time because you went very slowly, but in, in that case, I might tell you to uh, to continue. But the limit would also be marked by if there is someone else right after you, then I cannot have the next person wait because that would have a domino effect on the people who schedule their interviews earlier. So 10, 15 minutes. And if it is nine instead of 10, you're not going to be penalized. But if it is five instead of 10, I'm going to tell you, tell me more. I'm going to ask you some generic questions about uh, the, the short story to elicit your, your input on those. Brianna? Uh, I was going to say, would you, uh, would you just like ideally a summary of the story and then just like social themes of the story, you know? Um, for the presentation? Yeah. Again, I wouldn't follow the template. Okay. I would make it a show and tell. You can include a summary of the story, make it quick enough, and then, ideally, you would put on the screen some passages, read some of the sentences in those passages. You don't have to read the whole passage. You can talk about it while it is on the screen and we both have it in front of us and I can read from it as you explain what is that is particularly interesting in that passage or how that passage is crucial to the development of the relationship between the characters and the technology or the way the technology carries on the story, right? And one simple way to start your presentation would be to motivate what pick, what, what to explain, describe what motivated you to pick a particular story or what the strongest aspect uh, in that story would be and then you can go back to providing some context right it is a presentation so you're trying to make a good impression on the person you're presenting to right uh, so the, the the first part of the presentation should be used for something that is that already has some relevance some importance rather than a boring presentation. During this presentation, I'm going to introduce a story, then I'll analyze this, uh, etc. Et when I was saying it doesn't have to be formal, I was referring to the kind of modality where you explain what you're going to say at the beginning, and then at the end, you explain what you said, which for a 10-minute presentation usually 
is not exactly necessary unless your audience is not particularly uh, attentive. Okay, and find a style that suits your approach uh, as a reader, as a student who worked on this material. Don't try to be overly formal because your assumption is that being a university student means to write formally, to present formally. Because the, the, the form you choose in terms of style, of course, your, your, your project cannot be uh, colloquial or informal, right? If you give a presentation in front of your professor, you don't start with, what's up, man, right? Or you don't say, so in this story, these two dudes are going on a trip, right? But you don't have, you, you remove from your mind the idea that if you use a plethora of, instead of many, you are being academically formal. No, you're being pompous, right? Because where's the need for uh, uh, a certain kind of uh, archaic uh, language? Your language should be clear, convincing, to silence the, the watch, uh, but it should match the purpose of your investigation and analysis. You're not getting points at a university just because you replace regular words with rare words that very few people use. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, I don't know any professor at this point, not even those who are 75 who go by those standards. Yet, I still find students sometimes who are just trying to put themselves in this mindset, oh, it's a paper, so let me take the thesaurus because this is my way to an A. No, right? Uh, you have to make sure that the language is precise, it reads well, both in your oral presentation and in your final project, you're not getting any extra points for uh, using exotic verbiage. Any more questions for now? I will offer another opportunity on Thursday, right? Since Thursday is the last time we see each other. Keep sending me requests if you have stories that you want me to evaluate. I've done that um, both uh, based on emails I've received from the students and also uh, links that were added to the Google Docs uh, file and even next week and the week after that through the time of the presentations I'll be available for meetings either in person or via zoom for in-person meetings even outside of my office hours I can be available because I'm here usually on campus at least four days a week Monday through Thursday and uh, if you, if you, the office hours are not convenient for you, just suggest the day and the time and we start from there via yeah, email. Otherwise, you can use Calendly to um, schedule meetings. Make sure you use the right link. There is a link to set up to schedule your oral presentation. There is a different link in the calendar to schedule your meetings. One says short meeting with Dr. Fede. The other says our oral presentation, CCS 325. So let's proceed. Um, so let me go back. So the motto made across the continent is an extraordinary young adult novel published in 1911, part of a series of five or six novels with the same protagonists. And the choice of the protagonists and the context in which they're placed makes this kind of novel so interesting because we have a group of teenage female students from a high school in West Haven, Connecticut, in a posh part of the country, all, of course, from well-to-do families, from wealthy families, who are traveling through the world, the United States, but if you look at the series of novels, they will go to Ireland, they will go to Asia with their cars. So 
They are completely independent and they are driving the car owned by the most noticeable of these characters, Wilhelmina Campbell, who goes by the nickname of Billy for her friends. You have four friends from the same high school who have completed their year and during the summer, in this particular novel, will be driving Billy's car called the Red Comet from Chicago to all the way to San Francisco going across all uh, the, the states that you find in between having uh, adventures that uh, introduce them to not only the world of adult society, but they expose them to areas of society and uh, the US that they would never had encountered or experienced directly, personally, without their mastery of the technology of the automobile. If they didn't own this automobile, their world would be much narrower. Of course, it's a young adult novel, and therefore, it's supposed to be read by other teenagers, most of whom, 99.99% of whom, don't have a car, don't even have the means to acquire a car, and probably live in a family in 1911, at least 99% of them, which doesn't own a car. However, the purpose of this kind of literature it is exactly to allow the reader to live vicariously, to explore the world, to experience the thrills of the automobile and the adventures that the automobile will afford the characters through the pages of this novel. Yet, even though all of this is supposed to be exciting and new, young adult fiction also is aware not only of its commercial uh, nature, right? You want to sell as many of these books as you can, but there is also uh, some awareness of the educational nature of this enterprise. That is to say, this book is written for teenagers who are going through a period of change, who are growing and trying to enter adult society. Therefore, as much as you find in here episodes where these young women behave in a way that wouldn't be normal for people their age, simply because they take a car and they leave their place, the place where people know who they are, where people can judge them, and therefore people can indirectly impose some kind of self-censorship on them. Let me not be seen doing this because my reputation in this community would be tarnished vis as opposed to I'm thousands of miles from home I may be nostalgic, but I can certainly see the opportunities for freedom and a freer kind of behavior. In spite of this, the publishers are aware of the educational value of the judgment rendered on this kind of literature by society, because society knows that these uh, readers might imitate the behaviors of the characters. So, Society doesn't want young adult fiction to be dangerous, right? To be radically new, uh, to be changing the standards. So, the characters in the stories are pushing the boundaries, thanks in no small part to the technology. They're changing the roles of women in society, especially for some women. But there is some internal censorship, starting with the fact that these four teenage female high school students from West Haven, Connecticut, are escorted by cousin Helen, who's in her 20s, the cousin of um, Billy. So someone who acts as a chaperone, right? The chaperone was a, a, a role that was established in society, well, into the 20th century. And you find some of that in other novels, right? For example, if you go back to The Lightning Conductor, the chaperone there is Aunt Mary. And Mary is there to, uh, to, 
to supervise, to monitor over Molly Randolph's behavior, even though you practically never see Aunt Mary restricting her behavior. The same is true for cousin Helen, who's there to give some legitimacy to the behavior of the girls in the story, uh, to protect them, to give them warnings and recommendations, especially about uh, bad characters, right? Men who can be risky or dangerous to entertain a relationship with. But in the end, her role in terms of censorship or restricting the uh, behaviors of the other younger characters is quite limited. And in some ways, when they're trying to push the norms, the fact that Helen doesn't say anything becomes a way to, to legitimize, to make that kind of behavior acceptable, okay? But keep in mind the twofold uh, uh, functions of the, uh, of the story. To provide thrilling adventures that someone who would never be able to have those adventures can have through the pages, but also to educate, to uh, keep the extent of the uh, deviations from the norms to a, an acceptable amount or an acceptable quality. We don't know who the author is. Catherine Stokes is just a pseudonym, and we know that at that point in time, 1911, a lot of publishing houses, especially for young adult fiction, establish the practice of creating a, a format. And the format can be, we have a group of uh, uh, teenage students going around the world with a car, but by themselves. Only with a slightly older woman as a chaperone, but no real adult uh, in uh, the, there with them to, to scold them or to tell them exactly uh, what to do, and of course the adventures have to be somewhat picturesque, exotic, right, different from uh, what everyone would have. Uh, and once you establish this kind of format, you can call on an atelier, a group of writers, telling them, okay, you write the first book in this series the first book will be introducing the high school these kids go to and how they know each other and add some adventures to that. The next one, without waiting for the first book to be completed, you go to the next writer and you tell them, you write a story where they go from Chicago to San Francisco. You write another one, uh, the next writer from San Francisco to Japan, etc. This way you can have a book coming out every month or two months or th every three months and you try to sell as many as possible and you continue repeating this process until you sell books. When you see sales declining, then you close the series and you move to a different format. And you need to have a name that sounds nice enough and the main choice is should, should we make the writer a woman or a man but then you don't even know whether there is a man or a woman behind this name, okay? So, often we know who's behind a pseudonym, but that's not the case, especially past the 19th century. We certainly don't know who Catherine Stokes is. That was the company, Donahue and Company in Chicago, and these are some other examples. The most egregious example of this would be the Stratemeyer Syndicate, a publishing company that published uh, similar titles, for example, the Motor Boys and the Motor Girls series were published by the Stratmeyer Syndicate and the Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. So these, of course, were based on technologies. The Motor Boys start with bicycles, graduate to motorcycles, then go on to um, automobiles, and in some stories you see them on motorboats or flying uh, uh, technologies as well. The Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys series 
are based on investigations, right? In here you have a young woman or young man acting as <coughs> private investigators and finding uh, um, the solution to various kinds of mysteries that don't have to be related to a murder or a theft. Um, there could be other kinds of uh, situation a la Scooby-Doo, uh, for example. And some of these were published for a long time. Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, even though they were originally published in the 1910s, 10s, 20s, and 30s, they were sold, they were still being sold in the 1960s and 70s. I read Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys growing up in Italy, translated into Italian in, in the 1970s. I still have at least a couple of those books in my basement. Yeah, my brothers okay. had some Hardy Boys novels uh, in the 90s. Yeah. They still publish them. And sometimes the only intervention they would make, republishing them later, was to re um, delete, remove any detail that would make the reader understand that the story happens in 1915, to make it universal, right? Because if the story talks about an automobile and doesn't provide any details, the reader will assume that it's an automobile like the, the cars he, see, he or she sees around them. Uh, no need to see them cranking the automobile. You remove or change a few lines here and there, and, and you make them universal, a universal kind of fiction. Okay? And you can click, if you want to have an idea, you can click and see some of the original editions of those, of those books. Inside the Gutenberg.org website, you find most of the Motor Maid uh, series. School Days is the first one, by Palm and Pine is probably the, the next one, but the first three were published within a few months. So very close to one another. The Motor Maids Across the Continent, Motor Maids by Rose Shamrock and Thistle, where they go to Ireland, uh, Motor Maids in Fair Japan, Motor Maids at Sunrise Camp, 1914, and then we don't find them uh, anymore, or maybe there are one or more uh, that may not be present in digital archives. The memory of this series was not completely forgotten. Ron Paget, who's a writer and a poet, living poet, um, rewrote the Motor Maids across the continent. At least he said, this is a rewriting of this novel. I have a copy of that. And it's pretty similar to the original. There are dramatic changes, some adjustments to the language, and you can find more about it on his personal website, and you can know who he is. You can even find a podcast when he talks about his idea, why he picked this novel and decided to rewrite it. And you can find an ex excerpt of his um, uh, version of the story. Again, keep in mind how these series are relevant for our investigation. In this case, the Motor Boys, uh, the pseudonym under which they were published was for the author Clarence Young, but there is no Clarence Young. It's a group of writers uh, being commissioned these novels and the novels then being published uh, under this name. If you go to Google Books, you can see some of the illustrations, for example, as I said before. These are the motor boys starting as cyclists, right? But cyclists that are taking risks, that are riding on their bikes in races, right? This is the representation of a velodrome, right? An oval-shaped track where you can reach high speeds, and it is, even today, kind of dangerous. You uh, can certainly fall and hurt yourself. And the conclusion of this particular novel is them moving up. After they've moved up to motorcycles, moved up to their first auto. And, and that's how the series will continue. And you can explore a similar book with the automob automobile girls in the Berkshires, right? I've added a few sections about 
women and automobiles during this time, especially around 1910 and until 1915, the press, the media were giving a lot of attention to women and automobiles. Yes? Another common theme I noticed within these works is that it's often the middle class during this period or the people in a prestigious enough, like with enough wealth to do so, are mainly the ones that are pushing boundaries. It's just, is this just like a coincidence inspired by perhaps the author's own life experience? Or is no. it more so that example of internalized censorship you mentioned earlier? Neither? Well, the boundaries existed and were stronger in previous societies such as the 19th century American society. If anything, the boundaries are being pushed and slowly broken up during this period. But in this case, especially in this kind of literature, the, the driving force is not feminism exactly, although there is a, an echo, a reflection of feminist arguments. My theory is that uh, the, the breaking up of the family, the breaking up of social norms in these novels are based mostly on the idea that in a consumerist society, the best uh, uh, setup for selling as many products as possible is to have individual consumers. That is to say, to show that you can get a car and go places, you don't need your parents with you, you don't need someone to tell you what to do. So Molly Randolph, who has the means, has the money, will first buy a car and then tell his father I purchased the car, right? Uh, so the idea is to multiply the number of consumers because if the family uh, uh, lives together and agrees together on their purchases, then there is only so much that you can sell them. But especially if you target uh, um, groups that were previously excluded from the power to purchase, such as women or young men, and women, you will be able to multiply the number of consumers because they're perfect for the typology of the ideal consumers who, who is someone who acts on a whim. I see something, I like it, I want it, I want it now. And then I want to be seen with it. And to be seen with it, showing, as it happens in this novel, that by being seen around an automobile, for example, or being seen with a certain kind of clothes, you gain the attention of others, which is altogether a new modality for communal interaction. I don't go into society with an established social role or function. I go into society as if, if it were a stage or a theater. I go around and people will look at me and I'll measure my success from the number of eyes that uh, are placed on me by the amount of time that people keep looking at me. If you do that, then you multiply the power of those products. Then more people will want to be seen with the same products, right? So this is what pushes the breaking of boundaries that would restrict such behaviors. But in many ways, you can say that the bourgeois family was experiencing a crisis already in the uh, during the 19th century right and many of the narratives in the 19th century represent an attempt to restore the power of those rules exactly because they were crumbling already okay so i added a few sections for your curiosity i recommend that you look at them uh, about some of the famous women because you have to understand the context that the readers of these novels had in mind, because even the readers of, those, of these novels uh, uh, saw uh, uh, the, the magazines, the pictures, they, they went to theaters and saw newsreels about these famous women uh, um, doing things with automobiles that make them famous. For example, Alice Ramsey drives across the US with three other women in 1909, right? And you find some pictures and more details about that. Anita King, also known as a Paramount Girl, drives across the US by herself in 1915, and it's all a media stunt that would uh, uh, bring attention on her, because then the next year she will appear on a film called The Race, right? 
and you find in here other actresses being depicted as automobile drivers. Now, feminist themes are, are present in here, right? They're not ignored. They may be reframed, but they're not at all ignored. So you find another cross-country trip made by two women sponsored by the National American Women's Suffrage Association to call attention on the issue of voting rights for the women. In Europe, you find similar examples. Uh, British driver Violet Cordery has a huge number of records, especially for endurance. Uh, the, the one I like the most is, I think, from 1927, 30,000 miles in 30,000 minutes, which is 20 days. So she took turns with her sister driving this car at about 60 to 70 miles on average on a racetrack for 20 days. And she did something similar, 5,000 miles, 10,000 miles. She did, I don't remember how many thousand miles in reverse, just to set a record that no one had uh, established before. That's why, hence the nickname Long Distance Lady. And she went on to race in various races, to be an evangelist uh, for, for the technology. And, and there are books that have been published on this. Of course, the automobile is not the only technology in this book in reference to mobility. You also find one quick reference or two to a motorcycle in a more important episode having to do with, <coughs> with planes, right? So why? presenting both the automobile but giving some space also to other technology, especially the plane. Because the idea of space is being redefined by these technologies for enhanced mobility, right? The United States, especially the Midwest areas that had not been uh, explored, that were not heavily inhabited, that were more mysterious to a lot of Americans living on the West or the East Coast, all of that becomes reachable, is within reach for people with the automobile and even more for people with the plane, okay? So places that look very distant and mysterious from West Haven, uh, all of a sudden are uh, there, available to your fruition if you have an automobile or even a plane. Of course, it's a picturesque representation of the technology of the plane. The episode in question is they are driving uh, uh, through the plains outside of Chicago. They've left uh, Chicago that day or the next day or the previous day, and they see this, this speck, and they recognize it's a plane. They can see the man inside, and then at some point, the plane comes crashing, and they go try to rescue the, uh, the pilot of the plane, they find him and he's still alive, uh, the, the plane is destroyed, uh, and, and they offer a lift, a ride to this young man, of course, a single young man with this group of young women. He says that he's Peter something, a millionaire, a hero of sorts, right? Uh, nice, handsome boy who can drive, who can fly a plane and comes from a wealthy uh, family. Then the story has a twist where uh, somebody suggests after he has left the, the girls that he was in fact a, a, a thief who stole and then used the plane to get away from Chicago. But this makes him even more mysterious <laughs> and more attractive in a way because it's a, such an up-to-date, modern, uh, cool kind of uh, criminal. But the picturesque aspect of the episode is the following. Why did the plane crash? The pilot will explain to the uh, young women in the car that he sneezed and sneezing, he pushed the, uh, what is the, the, the rudder? Well, well, he sent the automobile, the plane in a nose dive and couldn't recover from that, okay? so. Keep in mind, it's young adult fiction. The participants have to be qualified, meaning you cannot place in access, in the interaction with the technology, 
anyone. It has to be a certain social profile, right? Which is at the same time distant from the reader, but not so distant. In this case, we have high school maids, young women from this West Haven High School, and so people would have known during the period about West Haven being a place with rich families living in the area. The main protagonist is Billy, who's not only driving the car, but also the one in charge of repairing the car. So fluent, familiar with the technology. It's a romantic kind of heroine, meaning it's still the kind of heroine we would have found in traditional romantic stories of the end of the 19th century. In some ways, she resembles a feminist but in many other ways, she's still a traditional woman. She comes from a family where there is attention to technologies of mobility. Her father is an engineer working on railroads. Interestingly, as we found in other stories, and as you still find in many stories, she's an orphan, no mother, the father is away working in Russia, right? So she has complete independence, no authority figure other than this young cousin just in her 20s, cousin Helen to watch over her, right? So she can go through these changes. And again, the reader would have dreamt to be in the same situation. If I didn't have a family to tell me what to do, then I could become my own woman, have these wonderful adventures, know these wonderful people. My life would be incredible, right? The other young characters and don't really have such a strong profile. There are very small psychological differences between Mary, Nancy, and Eleanor. They're there to create a group. At some point, they will spend a lot of time with a friend they find on the road called Evelyn, another woman, okay? They have a chaperone, cousin Helen, and she is introduced in the first page as the carrier of a moral message, of a moralizing message. So the first thing that Cousin Ellen will say in the story is, at my age, meaning to find myself driving through the country on an automobile in, in places that we've never been uh, potentially dangerous, not just for their lives, but for their reputations. You understand that? And what is the foremost danger for their reputation. If we spend so much time on a car, moving from place to place, then without roots in a community, what are we becoming? What are we turning into? We're turning into immigrants, right? Because we're moving away from home to some other unknown land. We're turning into gypsy vagabonds, which is the sum of uh, two ideas of people who don't have root and move constantly, the response given by the other characters is, yes, you're right, we see the risk, but look at the situation from this angle, dear cousin. We might be seen as gypsy vagabonds, but will be up-to-date gypsy vagabond emigrant. Meaning, the most important thing is to be seen, to provoke the attention, to be pointed at by people saying, oh, look how fashionable they are. Look how trendy they are, right? So up to date is the key. Doesn't matter if people see this as a negative to embrace mobility, if we see that as a fashionable choice. 